Hola, Bernardo. <clears throat> Welcome back to Avant Garde, Fin de Cycle, and Rodin. I'm bringing you up to speed today on some videos that show you some um, envelope pushers, as I like to call them, people who challenge traditions and challenge notions or ideas. And that's definitely true of somebody like Paul Cezanne. Um, Cezanne is often grouped with the post-impressionists, but I really need you to think of him as kind of like a sidestep away from the tradition where you've got Van Gogh and Gauguin on one side, completely given over to their own personal connection to color. Uh, Cezanne is really trying to do something altogether different. He's really trying to be more analytical and more objective and to create something more solid of the old form of impressionism and the way that he analyzes his structures and shapes. I'm going to try and show you that today in the PowerPoint. So um, basically, let me get rid of my little inset here and we'll get started with um, Cezanne. Um, first things first, you guys have in the image set the image of Mount St. Victoire, and that's an image that's obviously going to be painted several different times. I just want to recommend that you rewatch the uh, Khan Academy video. It did basically everything you need to know about this, but there are some things I just want to point out by looking at some more uh, views of the mountain. Um, they, they told you in the video where he was from, the south of France. They told you essentially he's kind of an outsider. He started in Paris, but ends up in the south of France. Doesn't really exhibit until late in his life, but um, right after his death, he becomes incredibly influential for the 20th century painters Picasso and Brock and Matisse. So um, he provides almost like a link between the old world and the early 20th century moderns that you just can't overlook. Um, and he's incredibly valuable in our study of art history. So um, looking at this particular view, guys, you can already see that the mountain is going to be important to him. It is a landmark of the area around Aix-en-Provence. Um, it is something that Cezanne wished to experience out of doors, um, so he preferred to be on site, um, walking all over the hilltops of, of, of Aix-en-Provence and really trying to understand the shapes that were coming to him uh, from the mountain. Here you can see already, we've got almost like a dissection of color and you're seeing brush strokes that are really iconic for Cezanne. Um, I think in the video they called them hatching. Um, I've heard people on exams describe them as hash marks, you know, those little um, abrupt hash marks that you make. If you're marching band, you, you know hash marks are on the field and they're the shortest line on the field. They're almost like dotted lines. And I can imagine that playing into his, his uh, process here because he applies those in like regimented little short abrupt strokes. So you're going to see how these are different than um, some of the other painters from the time period. But so if you're unfamiliar with the geography of France, guys, I just want to point out um, Arles is where Van Gogh was working and it's right next door to Aix-en-Provence. So we are in the south of France. We're not on the coast like Marseille or Toulon. Uh, or Ken, we're basically in the interior in a mountainous part of the country that's really seen as more provincial and more rural. Um, today, um, you can see the connection to the mountain there, almost the same view that we have in the, in the view of Mount St. Victoire from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. That's the one that's in the image set. Um, so he's really, I mean, he's copying from nature, but he's creating composition. And that's where um, we, we have to understand his process. So today, if you ever get to go to Aix-en-Provence, you can actually take a tour of where he walked. Um, there, the stops along the way are marked with little bronze ingots that are put into the ground of where you are. So places that are significant to him are highlighted. He's kind of like the hometown boy for Aix-en-Provence. So um, just a note for your travels later on. But um, you, you saw in the video that there's almost like 30 paintings of this thing. And when artists focus on something that's like that in a series, it really is, it, it becomes an opportunity to see their style change over time. Um, we're seeing the mountain here kind of break down into washes of different colors that really are not blended in and not meant to create like a window on the world, like a believable photograph. We're really looking at the basic shapes that make up the image of the mountain in its landscape. We still kind of have a sense of foreground and background here because the colors kind of recede to that blue in the background, but you're going to see um, that eventually just fades away. It becomes less and less of a concern, and we're already seeing areas of the canvas, guys, if I use my laser pointer here, that are unfinished, that are, are basically making us very aware that this is uh, paint on canvas. It's not a photograph, right? And that was intentional. You even see a little bit 
of that happening here in the mountain. So it was never his intention to kind of blend those colors together and make you kind of, you know, fake you out into thinking that you were looking at a real mountain. He wanted to really study composition. What, what colors do I need to put where to build this up and emphasize the structural qualities of what I'm seeing in front of me? Um, and he would do this many times. Sometimes there'd be structures in the foreground um, that you can see there. Here, um, they're just almost like um, minimal shapes, aren't they? They're, they're boxes. And that brings to mind one of the quotes that he is noted for. This is in Gardner's, and I'll read it to you. Um, this is his writing, um, describing his method in a letter to a fellow painter. He wrote, treat nature by the cylinder, the sphere, the cone, everything in proper perspective, so that each side of an object or plane is directed towards a central point. Lines parallel to the horizon give breadth. Lines perpendicular to this horizon give depth. But nature for us men is more depth than surface, whence the need of introducing into our light vibrations represented by reds and yellows, a sufficient amount of blue to give the impression of air. So from that quote, guys, the real takeaway is that this guy, he's breaking down the picture into a basic vocabulary of shapes, and he uses cylinders, he uses cones, he uses cubes. And, and that's a real important thing for you to remember because it's a direct influencer for cubism that will come later. You're going to see that Petit, uh, uh, Matisse and Picasso and Brock all looked at these things and saw something in this 19th century painter's work that made them think forward to the 20th. Um, and you can play that game here. If you kind of imagine looking at different views of Mount St. Victoire, we can see that there are cubes, that there are squares, that there are little shapes just kind of interspersed all throughout the landscape. Here in this vertical composition, you're also beginning to see the development of the zones that are in our work in the image set, where you have the foreground as one color, the midground as another primarily, and the background um, another. So the those zones are going to continue to be apparent in the work um, in his body of work later on. Um, here you can see again more views of the same view. Now they mentioned in the article um, the view of Mount Saint Victoire. If you move around the mountain, the height of the peaks changes. Right. Um, this this is this represents the fact that Cezanne is taking some liberty with his composition and trying to come up with the right fit, um, considering what his color harmonies are. He's not trying to paint the mountain. He's trying to create a composition on canvas. And we've got to accept that that's a very modern kind of tradition. It's, it's a flat composition. It's almost like the background is pushing forward, just like the foreground. And we kind of have this spatial ambiguity that's really making it hard for us to know what's in front of what. It, when you get closer to these saisons and the museums, you, you definitely can tell these flat patches of color they almost look like a quilt of different pieces that have been put together to make the composition complete. So I'll challenge you to do that in the Kimball. When the Kimball reopens, there's uh, there's not a Mount uh, Saint Victoire, but there is a view of Lestat, which is very similar to what Brock paints a little bit later, and I'll show you that here in a second. I like this one that's in London, the Courtauld Gallery, because it kind of emphasizes the fact um, Cezanne is riffing here. He's allowing color to move all over the canvas, and in this one, he's put Mount Saint Victoire in the middle of the zones, uh, the, the lower zone being mostly greens and yellows the middle zone, the purples and blues of the mountain, the upper zone is like free form green again. And it kind of unifies the composition. So those colors get introduced all over to create a sense of balance. I have to tell you, um, these look gestural, right? Like they were done very, very quickly. They were not. Um, Cezanne, in some of his still lifes, would actually have his, his subject rot before he was finished because he was so deliberate in thinking about where to put the next brush stroke. So I, I really need you to see he's not doing Van Gogh. He's not doing uh, Gauguin. He's not any like any of the other impressionists who simply gesturally render their things in the field and call it quits. He 
is painstakingly applying slowly the next color to canvas. So his process plays out a lot more slowly. Um, all right, so this is the work that's in the image set for um, Cezanne. And having seen those other views of the landscape, you can kind of see this is, this is toward the end of the process, isn't it? This is one of the more disjointed um, pieces. And some people have even said that it's unfinished. But it gives us an opportunity to see what the building blocks of his composition really are. They are boxes and cubes and hashtag, hashtag marks of little blues um, all over the place. When you look at the cliff, you can really see it starts to break apart into fields of color. And if you hadn't seen the previous image to know that that was a mountaintop, you might think that you were looking at like an abstract expressionist piece, right? Um, but stepping back, it, it kind of resolves itself. Now they mentioned the still lifes in um, the video as well as the, the essay, but they didn't really show you any. And I wanted you to see, we can really put this mantra of cylinders, cones, and spheres to work. When Cezanne paints a still life, guys, he paints it in such a way that it's like a composition of multiple views at once. And that really challenges our notion of what a traditional still life is. I see these these peaches, I guess, is what they are, but they don't block each other from our view the way that they would rationally in a typical Renaissance-like portrait. They stick out as individual spheres, and it gives the, the artist some like freedom to kind of explore the subject matter as really more composition than representation. Um, you see it many times over, um, and he's very popular for his still life. Um, one of the things that you really see here um, in this grouping of apples, if you look at the left-hand side of the table and you look behind the plate of apples, you seem to see one particular part of the table moving around. But when you get to the other side of the plate of apples, they don't line up, right? There's, there's something that's disjointed about that that fractures the picture plane. And that probably comes from Cezanne's practice of working on these things over an extended period of time where certain details may not have been exactly where they were before, but he doesn't try to correct that and create something that's not true to the moment. And it creates that little jog that basically shows up later in later artists' work as something that's a fractured picture plane. I'm describing cubism to you guys. Um, so that's something that we're going to see later. If you look at the coffee cup here, it is, it's a cylinder, right? And it almost exists independently of the saucer that sits underneath it. Um, the apples on the plate, they don't like sit in a way where you see some that are, you know, half rendered or some that are blocked, maybe the one in the back. Um, but they really give you a great opportunity to see the hashtag approach by which he rendered the color on that shape. Um, so here you have a little study in studio of a Cupid, typical marble little plaster figure. Um, but if you look carefully, I'm just going to use the highlighter here. It's basically a whole series of circles. I can start with the baby round cheeks, the little forehead, um, even the hair looks like it was basically a bunch of circles. I can definitely see that in the pectoralis major there. I see it in the belly around the navel. I see it in the buttocks even down through the thighs. This is, this is kind of like a whole series of circles that have just been stacked up to create a human figure. So um, it applies to his figures as well, not just his landscapes and still lifes. But um, here is another example. Um, we're looking at a still life where the plate has been turned up to face the viewer and we're looking down on tops of the apples but the table is still almost in profile. We've got a little bit more spatial ambiguity here where you're looking at this edge of the table sticking really far forward. But when you get to the other side of the table, it just seems to be randomly somewhere there, just indicated and not fully rendered. So that creates some more spatial ambiguity. If you look up here, guys, can you see brush broke? Let me use a laser pointer pointed out here hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. This is kind of his process for making those little brush marks. And that's very different when you think of like somebody like Vincent van Gogh, right? Those curvilinear forms that stretch all over long shapes. Here, the brush strokes are more abrupt. That's what's going to lead some people to say um, he was really attacking the canvas, right? You can almost see him hitting the canvas to get that black little section out. 
Um, if you try to recreate those movements in your mind, that's basically what we're talking about there. Um, more still life that you see here, this time featuring a skull. Um, but when you look closer at the skull, it's not a round shape. It's just a pastiche of different colors. There's swatches in black. There's swatches in red. There's some yellow there. Um, of course, there's the black for the eyes. I mean, basically, um, the shape exists as like a flat assembly of color. Um, here is a self-portrait, and I really like looking at his bald head here. <laughs> that round shape, you really can see the hashtag marks, right, in different colors. And if you look closely at them, they, they tend to, like, disappear. But if you back away from the screen, it makes sense as color and shadow or light on surface. Now, let's be clear, um, Cezanne is not trying to capture a moment in time on canvas. He's simply trying to analyze and be more rational in the way that he puts his shapes together in a composition. So um, this is a famous art dealer, Ambrose Vallard. Funny story, he comes to Cezanne in the south of France all the way from Paris, not once, but 60 times. Cezanne was so meticulously slow. It reminds me a little bit of Johann Vermeer. Um, but Vallard finally got frustrated with all the trips, wanted the piece to be finished, and um, it never really was. So that's how painstaking um, Cezanne was about how to put figures together. If you look at this guy, he looks almost like a rag doll. His fingers in the front there, part of his fist, all look like parallel cylinders. His body is put together in, I mean, um, his face is rendered just minimally. And it seems like we're really trying to put together a more modern version of what the portrait should be. Um, here you've got another famous Cezanne. I think the funniest detail about it is the spoon and the cup. It's standing straight up. We know it would be resting on its side, but the idea is it's a concept of a spoon, not a depiction of a spoon. And it can be best represented or best uh, um, understood in that position rather than laying down on its side. Um, the cylinder of the coffee pot, the, the almost doll-like connection of arms and body parts, um, spatial ambiguity that you see in the front of the sitter is, is continued in the back where sometimes edges of whatever this is in the back paintings or decorations on the wall does not line up. Um, so that gives you kind of the idea. Now, um, basically, if we move forward, I'm just showing you some famous Cezans. Look at this little hat here, right? I'm sitting on top of that very large head. Um, in a raggy kind of, of sewn together way where the people look like basically um, geometry that's just been stuck together to create the picture. I mean, if you compared this to Caravaggio's card sharps and the Kimball, I mean, you would see the process is completely different. Same subject matter, but very different kind of effect, right? His Large Bathers is one of his late uh, paintings that's not completely finished but it gives you a chance to kind of compare his tradition to something like what Titian would have done hundreds of years before. If you take a look at the high level of finish and all the glazes that Titian puts into those fleshy, fleshy tones and compare them to Cezanne, you just realize that the, the aims of art have definitely changed. All right, so how are we gonna see this on your test, right? Um, you won't see still lifes, you won't see large bathers, you will see something that looks like landscape. So initially, that's where my head goes, right? You might see a compare and contrast here between Thomas Cole and the Oxbow, um, where we have the sublime power of nature overwhelming the viewer in the storm that's just come across the valley or the nationalistic aspirations of, say, Jose Maria Velasco, who's trying to show you a patriotic view of what he knows his country to be. Cezanne is not even about any of all that. He's about form. He's about composition. He's trying to use nature to create something um, that really is uh, more modern in its conception. I'll read you a quote here. Cezanne wrote in March 1904 that his goal was to do Poussin, as a classical landscape painter, Poussin over entirely from nature in the open air with color and light instead of one of those works imagined in the studio where everything has the brown coloring of feeble daylight without reflections from the sky and sun. He sought to achieve Poussin's effects of distance, depth, structure, and solidity, not by using traditional perspective and chiaroscuro, but by recording the color patterns 
an optical analysis of nature provides. So I think you can see um, this would be an interesting comparison uh, should it show up. But um, all right, there's a, a, a painting by Claude Lorraine. That's really what you can consider academic landscape. And should it show up, you see that Cezanne is doing nothing like that, right? He's not giving you foreground, midground, and background to create a, a beautiful picture of, of reality. He's really forcing nature to be his muse as he comes up with a new way to make art. You guys know this is a detail from Starry Night. I, I just thought it was interesting, and I'll point out with my laser pointer here. If you look over to the right or left-hand side, can you guys see that Van Gogh left some parts of his canvas undone too? Um, basically, you have the same kind of raw quality um, that expressionists will see later um, in these unmodulated um, brush strokes that are curvilinear and wispy. Um, whether you're talking about the cypress tree or you're talking about the swirls of wind, right? Basically, we see that this guy um, is doing some of the same things, but he, he has a completely different kind of effect, right? Um, if we add in Gauguin, Gauguin's concepts of nature from his painting here, we see really thick contour lines on the figures as well as in the landscape. Where you have fields of distance, they become flat fields of color, um, and if you notice in the background behind the God, there's a mountain there surrendered so completely differently, almost as if we're in the, the throes of some kind of long lost dream. Cezanne is really much more objective, right? Um, he's almost like the analytical side of post-impressionism, where the two on the left are more given over to the emotional connection. You feel the color. He's much more rational. Um, this is this is not something that he feels like passionately about or something that's supposed to overwhelm the viewer. He simply wants to use this as subject matter for thinking about how you make pictures. And that's that's an important uh, uh, connotation for um, influences later. You might see him compared to uh, George Brock, as you saw in the video. George Brock is going to do a, a cubist piece later called the Portuguese. And we're going to see that figure just a little bit. But here is Brock copying the process of rendering shapes and cubes and flat fields of color, it's almost like he used even the same hashtag brush strokes, the hatching that you see to the application of color. This is Picasso. So you know these guys were influenced by Cezanne. When he dies in 1906, the following year, 1907, there's a huge show, a retrospective of his works in Paris, and that's where they saw him. So you guys have to do a really big job here. you got to remember that when we get to the Portuguese, even though it looks a lot different than Cezanne, Cezanne is an influencer for Cubism that comes later, right? Um, for uh, Picasso, we're going to have his Les Demoiselles d'Avignon, and those blocky shapes of the human figure in the background, we can say that Cezanne had, you know, a real power over these guys moving forward. So that's where I'll leave it um, before I bring you back to talk a little bit more about the kiss and Gustav Klimt. We'll be talking about the Vienna Secession and a new form of art known as Art Nouveau. So I'll stop it there and see you guys here after you grab a snack.